Good evening and welcome to the Dream Speakers Digital Series. My name is Joshua Jackson and I am the director of the Rulabu Indigenous Arts Festival. Tonight we are featuring the works of three Indigenous writers across all disciplines and from many diverse backgrounds. If you like what you see tonight, please do not hesitate to visit dreamspeakers.org and donate. Anything over $20 will get a tax receipt. Or you could text DREAM to 20222 for a $5 donation. Tonight we have a very special show for you. Our first guest is Joanne Saddleback. Joanne has been working in this industry for a very long time, producing, uh, doing a lot of TV stuff, doing a lot of writing, has been an artist her whole life. And she is also the daughter of uh, activist Stan Daniels. And you'll see and you'll hear a lot of her work comes from that uh, upbringing. Joanne, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Joshua? I'm very well, thank you. Welcome to the digital series. Thank you. Thank you. So um, talk to me a little bit about your writing. Where, how long have you been doing it? You know, I've actually been writing and especially poetry since I was about 15 years old. And I just, it would come and go sort of like the flow while I did other things, but there was always the writing in the background, always. So I've been doing it for decades now. <laughs> 20 years tops, right? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So what kind of things inspire you in your writing? You know, writing, so many people it, it explain that they write, they have to have solitude, they have to have quiet they have to you know no one around them but for me it's the exact opposite i have to be in a really busy place i have to and being a writer i love having a pen and paper you know in hand and a new journal you know that i start and and i have to have buzz the noise around me all the time and uh it comes from it can come from a glimpse of somebody doing something it can come from my going on a walk. It can come from some wonderful, inspiring event, you know, that I've been part of. It, 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 the inspiration comes from everywhere. It can come from a person. It can come from a situation. It, um, you know, and that, that's where, wherever that, that inspiration is, it's just all around me all the time. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the kind of political things that kind of influence your art form? Political things, I'd say it would probably, if anything, it would be almost kind of anti-political <laughs> because it's more calming things, things that I, that I, um, they can be controversial, but they're, but they're not, uh, they're not trying to make some kind of firm political statement. I think if, if anything, I try to say that the, the diversity in which Indigenous artists, where we are, I think that that is more the statement that I'm trying to make, that I can write something that anybody could have written, but it comes from me, an Indigenous artist. And I think that that's important, that in order to be an Indigenous artist, you don't have to be writing about Indigenous things, although we do. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. That's great. Um, I, I can't wait. Um, so you got two pieces for us today. Yes, I do. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about this first one. This first one is called Nectar. I'm a real tea drinker. Anybody that knows me, it's tea, 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 and I'm the owner of a Cha 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 Art and Tea House. <laughs> and of course, it supplies my very favorite kind of tea. But this this one, it's also about me, I was doing writing. There used to be this one pub that I used to go to all the time. And I just found it so inspiring, all the people around me. I'd, I'm not a drinker, but I would ask them for tea. I would ask them for tea. And so that's where this, where this um, poem comes from. And uh, about after my, my work week, I'd go there on a Friday night and just sit there and write and drink tea all night. So that's the first one, Nectar. Did you want awesome. me to start now? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, join us out of that. <laughs> nectar. Ah, the solace of tea, a nectar for the weary. Earl Grey, chai, vanilla nut, 
take the work week in one cup and makes it less dreary. I prepare my tea geisha-like. Ceremony and ritual attest to the love. But today, I don't make such a fuss. It is served to me by the barmaid in this fine pub. And more than this, I'm surrounded by men quaffing down beer and laughing heartily, keeping the best company with my tea. It's all heaven sent. Today I have my journal, and last night put my hair on one big curler so I look like a nookami. I'm wearing black, looking so mysteriously, pen in hand, writing furiously. Such contentment, all coming together in a cup of tea. Nectar. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Where, um, where was this pub? This pub, uh, it was in Windsor, Ontario. It was an Irish pub, and it used to have really feisty political Irish singers in it. And you know, see these old Irish men stomp their hands on the table singing these old Irish, Irish uh, political songs. Like, like drinking <laughs> songs? Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah, I love that. Love yeah. That. So they used to awesome. bring me a lot of inspiration. <laughs> how, how long were you in Windsor? I was there for a year. I was there on contract. So it wasn't very long. And uh, a person who was also on contract that year was Marilyn Dumont. We met oh, each wow. other at a bus stop. We went to the same bus stop. She only lived like a block away from me. And she looked at me and she said, are you Joanne? <laughs> oh my God, you're Marilyn. <laughs> uh, so we for those of you at the same time. For those of you who don't know Marilyn Dumont, she is an incredible poet. She works at the U of A. She is one of the most inspirational um female indigenous writers so that was so cool that you guys got to meet in that in that you setting how, how long ago was that oh gosh really that was about like two decades now <laughs> so just when you started writing when you were 15 years old right <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right <laughs> awesome awesome so uh so what's your second piece today about this one is entitled conspirator and it comes from two different places. Paulo Coelho is one of my very favorite authors. And he writes about uh, how the universe conspires for our happiness. And I used to mentor under my uh, old uncle, Ralph uh, Cardinal. He was a healer, he was a teacher, he was a very sacred holy man. And I spent many, many, many years with him, him and my dear old auntie, uh, Regina Cardinal. And I didn't know that such a person like that could exist. He was just so profound. So I put those two ideas together because I saw him as a conspirator for us, that he was just so involved with the, the well-being of, of humankind. So I, I wrote this poem about him and uh, when he died, how I felt after he had died and what it was like to be part of his funeral and part of um, his life. Things I loved about him and were inspired about by him. Amazing. Amazing. And it's my it's my only Pauline Johnson like poem, and it's the kind of a homage to Ode to a Cattle Thief. You'll kind of recognize its rhythm and uh, the way it is by that. Awesome. That's great. Well, let's uh, let's dive into that. Thank you very much. So this is Conspirator. She called him Bonnets, my dear old aunt. I asked him what it meant, this Cree name, no protocol, so my uncle thought me rather blunt. And he replied and laughed, Bunnies. He gave me everything I need to live, this beloved and dear old man, now dead. He was so careful and so compassionate to everyone he ever met. Look at him, this elder. There may never be another like him all the priests and old people said. This medicine man, healer, my best friend, teacher, lived such a harsh and toiling life. So after I watched him take his last breath, I took my example from a strong stoic wife. She followed the old ways. For 10 days after, not one tear did she shed. His partner in life, his widow in death, she continues to breathe for him to see him to that place of waiting instead. From the funeral parlor, she brought him home one last time. 
sons carried him from room to room. Then she hitched up horses to wagon and rode him to the church as the dew moistened the earth in the stillness of the early morning gloom. Hundreds running to a thousand gathered that day as drums were beating with every step these horses made. Silence was intense, the heartbreak so loud, the sorrow of a people felt as we watched lovingly where he laid. In life, in his presence, one felt no pain or loneliness. He fed the human soul and his magic gave him grace. Love emanated from him for the race of man and to all living things his spirit did embrace. To look at him, one would never know such a man could exist. He was humble and poor, but we all knew him and his richness let us see the lines between life and death, the place where the spirit soars. His kindness and goodwill I never felt before. From one human being, he was so profound, extraordinary in depth and knowledge, yet meek and humble, now belonging to the ground. Mysterious and wondrous, he brought magic to the earth, and to his mother he went because he was hers. So what do I remember most about him as I still feel the lump in my throat? I met one true man who for our happiness inspired with me. I love my uncle Ray. Oh, wow. That was that was incredible, Joanne. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, for sure. Thank and, you uh, very much. That's uh, it was it was it's a lovely gift that you have that you can write in in a busy time and take these things. And if if I were to write, I, I I'm the other kind. I need the silence. So it's really cool that you you've taken all these things over tea and over um, your experiences and kind of put them in into a really creative outlet. So thank you so much for your gifts and uh, inspiring us all today. Thank you very much, Joshua. All right, Joanne, have a good day. You too. That was Joanne Saddleback. If you want to go visit the Cha Cha Shape Art and Tea House, visit 110 97th Street Northwest in Edmonton. And make sure you give Joanne a big hug for me. Our next guest this evening is a writer. He's an actor. He's a director, he's a filmmaker, he's a producer, he's a political activist, and a young professional working out of Vancouver, British Columbia. His name is Taryn Kootenay. Taryn, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Thanks, Josh. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to the Dream Speakers Digital Series. Yeah, thanks for having me. All good, man. So how long have you been um, like doing writing? Um, I've been like writing since I was like, uh, I think when I, was, I started writing when I was 18, yeah, I'm 26 now. And that was like the first time I ever like picked up a pen and paper and started journaling for the first time. And then, uh, that's the first time poetry kind of came out of that and then just kind of went from there. Awesome. Awesome. How were you like an artist before that? Or did you just kind of discover and come into yourself for that time? I kind of came into myself at that time. I was into like photography, um, like film photography for a while. So I, I guess I, you could say I was, a, I was a bit of an artist. And then uh, when I moved to Vancouver is when I started just like exploring more kind of creative outlets. And when I did that, then that's kind of when writing came more into play. I went to school for acting and then acting came into play. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'd say 18 was kind of a jump off point. Skateboarding is kind of an art in itself too. It's a sport and an art. So if you want to consider that, and I've been doing stuff since I was 13. <laughs> yeah, skateboarding is really uh, important to you. Um, you have a short film about skateboarding and identity. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, skateboarding is kind of like the first love I ever had, really. And it like got me into my body and out of my head, you know, like growing up with a single mother, it was 
never the easiest. And then I found skateboarding and friends kind of the solace I could get from it. Um, so for me, it was a really big like character building and um, yeah, just like really built me up as who I am. And it was something I could really like put a lot of my energy into my creative fun outlet. And so uh, I've carried that throughout the rest of my life into my arts, going into how I approach the world. Um, skateboarding teaches you a really like, you have to keep trying and persevere if you want to land something. And then when you land it, you want to do it with like, finesse or style. And so you learn to kind of add your own flavor and what your flavor is, is unique specifically to you. Um, and so yeah, I've always loved, and once I got into school for acting, uh, and I started kind of realizing more of my potential of storytelling and how I could, um, you know, make my own movies. I always thought it'd be really cool to have, to combine skateboarding and acting to the same world somehow. And uh, yeah, the opportunity kind of arrived when Tell a Story Hive was doing an indigenous storytellers edition where they had a grant for $20,000 um, for, yeah, people to just submit. And if you get it, they'll like, kind of run you through like a whole year of building a team and all these things and so yeah I've directed it and the story was based off of a real experience um I had uh encountered it was just like a retelling um and I got to use some of my homies got Joe Buffalo in there Adam George Adam Hopkins uh and then just like on the film team as well was like friends you know Paul and Ben Loon and stuff so it was really sweet just to like have uh people that I you know, really respect be a part of this like retelling of the story that the aim was to just make an indigenous like skate video film thing and yes yeah, it was a lot of fun awesome um i saw it at the imaginative festival and i i didn't even know i was um watching it because uh it was uh like the, the short story before the the main event and uh, I was so surprised to see it, and I was just so proud when I saw it. Is, uh, is there any, like, life uh, happening with that? Or are you going to release it anywhere? Or? Um, Imaginative continuing to uh, kind of pick it up. It's kind of had life in different elements. Like, my friend Maria Margareta Boucher uh, curated me in the Bill Reed Art Gallery for um, in a uh, a curation that she was the head of so that was interesting to <laughs> have a, the short film be in an art gallery uh i think imaginative is taking it on tour uh like a digital oh, cool. like virtual tour yeah so they're gonna be um just like going to offering it to schools or something like that um which is sweet um and then otherwise it's like free on telus like the streaming if you have telus you just gotta like it's kind of weird to find but it's there if you can go into the search bars and stuff and find up just like story hive you'll see like all of the uh short films that were created that year and i think even maybe the year before um so yeah it's free there and that was really cool actually because i got to show it to my grandma in cold lake <laughs> i always like want to show her stuff because i'm she's really not that tech savvy and she has tell us and i was like hmm, actually i wonder if it is here and it was so it was really cool just to kind of do a little like show and tell that's awesome um so what's the film called just for for our viewers up there yeah it's called diy yeah do you do it yourself d dot i dot y um yeah it's pretty a film fun. a film by taryn kootenayo all right taryn um you're gonna do some performing for us today some of your new writing um yeah i i love your poetry man it it really speaks to kind of the modern uh, indigenous situation and you do it with such such ease um what, what inspires the the poet in in this particular series um in this series it's kind of just like oh it's like a you know struggling to identify with like things i've learned growing up as an indigenous person, you know, as Dene, as Stoney, like, and, you know, going to powwow trails and like, they all feel like they were like a different timeline, <laughs> like ever since moving into a city and like, just like living this whole like life, it's kind of like, 
at one point I did, I was a grass dancer, like, and I, I did, like, I was learning dance something there, like, on the res, and it feels like so far ago, and, but I carry those things with me, and so I always am inspired by, like, the things that I carry, and what I, like, relearn, and just kind of always exploring that, and being really honest with, like, what those are and what inspirations or what inspirations I don't have and why am I not inspired I'm always just like thinking about that and just, so a lot of the poetry kind of comes out of that and sometimes comes out of anger from the colonial system sometimes it comes of like oh you know I actually like really love some things that I've learned and just like relishing in the love of it so these are kind of some things like that that's awesome that's awesome well you ready to give a rip Sure, yeah. Sure, a couple. Cool. Go. Give her, get it in. <laughs> At some point, I forgot I was indigenous. Money, rent, western top forties. Forgot the smell of freshly smoked moose hide. Lost sight of red, white, black, and yellow. Whistled at the northern lights. Curiosity, testing, and challenging protocols, and things told not to do. At some point, I remembered. Masicho, ishnish, nihotini, sweet grass. My hair was braided. My brain remembered my heart when I was six. But I'll never forget when I forgot I was indigenous. Awesome. What's this next one about? Hmm. Uh, it's kind of a little cheeky one. I'll just read it and then we can maybe talk about it after, I guess. And you can maybe guess what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Permanent markers bleed through like the blank look in your eyes when you're not telling me the truth. Residual evidence that there's more to the story. I wish our ancestors knew you were like a permanent marker, that your words meant more, that they'd Mudge the next chapter. Wow. Wow. Hmm. I won. I. I. I don't know. <laughs> I have. A, I have a guess, but I. I couldn't tell you. What it. What it would be, but it has to do with, like, vandalism. <laughs> yeah yeah am i am i close I mean, that's that's i mean that's yeah that's a good word for it for sure um so like there's actually a like permanent marker like bleed through in my journal right there oh, like so when i like flipped the when i flip the page to write and i seen these like two little x's I was still kind of in like a groove and so I just used that as inspiration like permanent markers bleed through and then I kind of just try to connect it to like broken treaties I guess and like it's kind of like a broken treaty is kind of like a you know permanent marker bleed through where it's like you're trying to like go to the next chapter but it's still like continues to like bleed through and you're always reminded Two. but the never last you can get to the end of the end of a end of a, a whole book and it'll, it'll be gone. So <laughs> nothing lasts forever. <laughs> well, that's awesome. You got a couple more for us, my boy? Yeah, yeah, sure. I need to actually just create like my own poetry book. I would like love that chat book. I've been like meaning to like. Yeah, oh, man. I've been working on. It. I had a lot of people like reach out and give me resources of like where to go, and so it's just about kind of just doing it. And this is a part of like what I'll be in it because these are kind of nice like one page, like chunks that kind of have a similar theme. And then I might just like throw in all the other kind of more popular spoken word pieces I've done over the years that. I kind of seem to regurgitate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I cannot yeah. wait for that book, man. I cannot wait for that book. And I'm sure yeah. our, our viewers, whoever's watching today, is 
are, is would love that. So, man, when it, whenever you get that done, you let me know. Thank you. Yes, I will. I will. Thank you for your support. Uh, yeah, this one is this is just kind of funny. I was just kind of I wanted to do a poem that's just like list, like just like a like things that I'm that I I've learned. Uh, yeah. Never say no to your said Always share what you have. Grieve with those who have lost. All things have spirit. Remember to thank water when you drink it. Ask water to help wash away anything that holds you back from being great. Be patient with others and also yourself. Forgive. Always try to upsell a product with a customer. Making your sales relationship personal will better the chance for them to come back and also spend more. Treat others the way they want to be treated. Teachings I carry, teachings I try to let go. Don't teach others who didn't ask to be taught. Pass down what you know. Listen not only with your ears, but your heart, spirit, and mind. Red means stop, green means go. Eagle is east, mouse is south, bear is west, buffalo is north. When the leaves are flashing their light green side, it means it'll rain. Without secrets, there is no power. Man, that's awesome. I I love that poem, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I like it too. Um, yeah. Here's another one. This is just a little cute one. I learned how to say I love you in my language so I could say it as sincerely as possible. Nega Nikita with my breath and the love of my ancestors before me. Nega nigita, like when a cat loves a dog and they cuddle to say love. Nega nigita, into the night and at the break of dawn, the stick bangs the drum and out came a love song. Man, I cannot wait for you to write this down. Well, he wrote it down, but like, so the general public can read it in a book and refer to these things because yeah, what what you're saying is just so so beautiful and very well very well put. For real. One of my favorite writers, man, Taryn Taryn Kootenail, for sure. You're definitely not not done hearing from this gentleman, for sure. Uh, I just want to take a minute to um, talk about your play. Oh yeah, okay. Um, White noise. Um, it had its premiere in the last couple of years, and uh, it's been quite a journey. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so White Noise is a comedy about racism, you know, real funny stuff. Um, and it actually almost world premiered, but because of COVID, uh, it got postponed until, um, I'm assuming the spring, because it doesn't really seem like things are fully opening up again uh, yet. But there was like a workshop production of it um, that was basically a world premiere. Um, it was only there was only two chances to see it, I'm pretty sure, or three, two in one day and then another different time. But that was really cool to be able to see. Uh, I got to see one of them, uh, the evening shows, and uh, yeah, I was happy to see that it actually was received really well. Like people laughed, people were like, they got mad. I could I sat in a perfect spot in between like some like kind of older white lady and like just like some native auntie in front of me and they were both like just like different ends of the spectrum of like what I was curious to find out it's like that you know native auntie would be like just laughing or then she'd be like no don't do it I'm like what what the hell and then you'd have this like white woman just like scoffing or just like making remarks like just like oh, this is unbelievable I can't and I'm like okay this is good it's like stirring people up it's like it's doing what it needs to do to like start a conversation you know but through using comedy and like making sure that it's like the spirit of it is like light humorous while talking about like darker maybe untouched topics uh, or like afraid to touch or they're difficult to discuss like in person a lot of the time because they get personal uh, when you're talking about racism yeah. uh, privilege whatever there's so many things that start to like bounce off or people deflect and it's it's difficult uh, and it usually you know ends up in a lot of different ways and so uh, yeah I kind of wanted to create white noise uh, and 
I cannot, I need, I need to like acknowledge Savage Society, um, Kevin Loring's company uh, for completely um, trusting me to um, just like put my full brain into it and like, you know, setting me up with like workshops with dramaturgs and like funding for the whole thing so I can just focus my time on that. Like I really uh, owe them a lot to, uh, to White Noise. But yeah, I, I just wanted to write it because I was kind of, fed up with racism <laughs> i love the premise i love the premise um tell us just a little bit of a, a synopsis of what what white noise is about yeah so it's like a native family um their son uh gets a lot of that new money and then he uh takes his family to vancouver because he wants to be in like a big, bigger metropolis because he is very tech savvy um and his parents promised him that like, you know, if, if he's successful, then he can, uh, they'll give it a try because they want their son to thrive. But they also want to make sure that he doesn't, you know, get lost in it and to always stay on his traditional side. Um, and uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'll do, I'll do all that, don't worry. And then they move to this like really fancy neighborhood in Vancouver uh, that he chooses because he's done his research and uh yeah they have these like neighbors that is a, are really like pc like white family like the father is a life coach the mom teaches yoga and the daughter is just like instagram famous i guess probably tiktok famous now but um yeah and they just like really want to meet the new neighbors and they invite them over for dinner but it's kind of like two different versions of canada collide and but have like big heart like they're like they're all good people but there's just like they just make so many like wrong mistakes and and we it's just like clashing the matriarchy with the patriarchy and like different types of class um and and yeah just kind of like seeing what happens right like um really just putting them together just to like mess with each other almost to see like what comes of it and through it, I'm able to talk about like uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of things we always hear, right? Like, like it's yeah. basically basically use stereotypes against each other, like stereotypes that make the native people stereotype, and then I like clash them, and then there, then try to like slowly peel those away uh, into something real. So the high, like it's a little corny, I think, but I I was going off of the premise that like white noise is the sound that you hear until something real happens. You know, like you hear like chatter and stuff in a room and then like <clears throat> something smashes and then all of a sudden people stop talking and it's just like this. And then, so it's like w the, the white noise I think is the stereotypes is the like pointing fingers at each other type stuff until like once you get all that out of the way, like what's really there. And it's kind of like, it's like our humanity and just like wanting to have like a secure and safe home and place to stay really comes down to and we get so caught up in all these other things and so it's just trying to like you know find what that is see where other people awesome. are with that that's that's awesome and i can't wait for people to see it once this uh this pandemic wraps her up for sure i think it'll, <laughs> yeah. it'll be quite successful but uh what's next in the uh, in the books for taryn well, there's a couple things that I have in my long trajectory. Um, currently, I'm working at just uh, with Access Theater, uh, Vancouver company, to start getting funding for like a a one man show, um, which will be like no, yet. Yeah, we're still trying to figure what that will look like, but that's some ideas. Um, I have this idea, and this is like a really long term goal but for like a TV series called The Band Office. <laughs> just like, just, just, a, just a good comedy, you know? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> like, the typical characters you find in a tribal office, right? Exactly, yeah, but even a little, and then just push it a little bit more absurd, like in terms of what problems they have to deal with. Uh, there's so many different ways you can go about it. Um, so I, I was thinking about that. So I've been just like building the world around for that thing and uh, yeah. It's kind of that, and then yeah, poetry. Just keep writing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to like really feel out what's what's next. So that I I've, I've got no idea in this, you know, 
colonial COVID world, you know, the climate's changing. It's just like, we got a fascist state brewing underneath us. Like, it's kind of, it's kind of freaky. So I don't know. A, a good old fashioned race war. <laughs> a good old fashioned race war. The reconciliation war they're going to break yeah. out. And, yeah. All the good things, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Taryn, thank you so much for um, being with us today and sharing us with uh, sharing with us what you've been working on and what you are working on and some of the things that uh, make make up your world. So thanks for being here today. Uh, love yeah. you lots, man. And I can't wait for our viewers to, to see what's next from you, man, man, for sure. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, been a pleasure. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Once again, that was Taryn Kootenayo. Uh, one of my favorite, personal favorite artists um, of of all the disciplines and uh, his social media is kind of fire too. He has this meme page called at dad fights that is all kind of indigenous political memes and his personal Instagram is ahek, A-W-E-H-E-C-K underscore. Give him a follow. Um, he's an awesome dude on, on social and uh, I can't wait to see what he has next. Our final guest today is the wonderfully talented Tareen Thomas. Tareen, how are you doing today? I'm great, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what, what you've been up to these days. Um, right now, I'm working on my master's at UBC in creative writing. Um, so with that, I've been, for the, the summer, I've been working on my thesis. Um, so that's gonna be, a collection of poems and short stories and a little bit of memoir. It's going to be kind of like a hybrid novel um, talking about um, my, my indigeneity, um, my connection to the land and all my relations and also me talking a lot about addiction, um, love, alcoholism, things like that. And I'm just going to see how all of that pieces together in the end and get that book published and then see what happens after that. Awesome. How long you got left in school? I have another year. Well, I have my fall semester and the winter semester. And I'll probably be writing throughout the summer. And then, yeah, I've pretty much finished. I'm halfway there at this point. Congratulations. It Thank seems like you. Just, it seems like just yesterday you were moving out to Vancouver. I know. It's crazy. It's been like almost a year now. That's awesome. That's awesome. How, how are you like in Vancouver? I love it. I love it. I love being by the water, by the ocean. I love the art scene. Um, there's a really rich indigenous community going on there. Um, it's, it's interesting um, moving to a different city because living in Edmonton, I always kind of had my networks and the people that I grew up with. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been challenging trying to um, like regroup and find people that I can work with. But I think it's also um, making me stronger as a person in terms of building new relationships and meaningful connection and how my art intersects with other people's art. And yeah. Awesome. Um, you just came back from a, um, a trip where you did your own salmon jars. Can you give us a, give us some, um, just a little bit of rundown what, what goes on in that? Yeah, okay, so um, I have a lot of family up north in BC uh, along the Skeena River, and every year my family goes up to do the salmon run the end of July, beginning of August. Um, so it's, it's a really long process. We're in the back um, cutting up fish and smoking and preserving for about a week. Um, my uncles will go and set the net, and then me and my grandma will, like, uh, dress the fish and then cut them up. So for the jarring, um, basically you you cut up the fish and then you have to have um, a piece of the backbone in the belly. And then it goes into these jars and then we use the pressure cooker. Back in the day, they would have just boiled it for four hours over a fire until it cooked, but we use a pressure cooker. So it takes 90 minutes. Technology is amazing. Um, but yeah. That's Sometimes, like, that's, hey? Yeah. I did five cases that took me, that took me about eight hours to do, um, just for myself. Um, but for everybody to like, we have our whole family working together. Um, so it, it, it helps out. Um, it's not as much, doesn't take as much time when we're all kind of working as a family unit. 
Um, and then a lot of my writing actually is inspired by, by that. I feel like I've always had a really deep connection to the water and to the salmon. And um, I feel like when I'm out there on the land, I feel like I'm just like learning new things from the wildlife and from the rivers and something that I can always take back every, every summer. Awesome. It's a, it's like a cool, like vacation that is, you know, super like spiritual and yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Good work. So like, uh, tell us a little bit about um, what you're, what you're going to be reciting for us today. Um, I'm going to share some poems with you. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, my connection to the land and how that affects basically everything that I do um, feel, think, see. Um, and I've been writing a lot about um, addiction. Um, so I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share some poems with you on that. It's a little chapbook I've been working on. It's gonna be, well, it's going to be a chapter in my, in my book, um, but it's, yeah, it's something that I was working on last semester. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, whenever you're ready, let's, let's hear some of it. Okay. Um, this one is called The Land Does Not Forget. You can't remember why you're there. Go back. The land that raised you does not forget. Put your feet in Siepi. Walk up the riverbank. Smell the pine, cedar, lavender, mint. Stick your hands in the dirt that house your ancestors' bones. Bury your body. Sacrifice your flesh wound to a ski. Resurrect your soul and begin again. Wiggle your toes to unearth your body. Let pissing watch magic into your escoteo. Do this four times a year or as needed. Um, yeah, so that's like, I'm honestly not even sure if it's finished yet, but I was thinking about um, kind of like my body and my art is sacrifice. And um, a, ski, a ski means earth and Cree. And like, I also do a lot of um, blending of, I, I put a lot of the Cree language into a lot of my poetry. I feel like for me, that helps me, it helps me um, regain some of my, some of my culture as well as kind of like, Creating it in with with my art, which is, uh, I found it's a lot easier for me to remember how to speak Cree and how to learn different words when I'm putting it into my writing practice. Um, but yeah, a ski means earth and Cree. So when it's like sacrifice your flesh wound to a ski, sacrificing the flesh wound being my body. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how trauma can. Um, take up space inside of your body. And like I was, I've, I've been, I've been calling that like a wound. Um, after I've, I'm really influenced by a lot of Billy Ray Belcourt's work. And in his first he's book, amazing. he uses, yeah, he's incredible. Yeah. Um, but he uses the word wound so much. And then like, I kind of like took on that word and I started applying it to some of my own poetry. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that one. I'll share mm -hmm. another one here. Awesome. Um, I actually, this, this poem was, um, it came from, you know, when you're trying to find that perfect Instagram, um, caption for a photo and um, I just wrote this one line. It's like shadow people follow you home when you're drunk. And then I really liked that line. So I sat with it for a while and, um, this is kind of what I came up with. I'll unpack the poem after, after I read it. Um, shadow people follow you home when you're drunk. Climb inside your head, burrow into your heart. They will coil around your bones, dissolve into your blood. There they will die. But over the years, they have grown smart. They know you can resurrect them. You resuscitate the darkness inside of your body with backwards medicine. That's when they take control. That's when you burn holes into your life. That's when you forget, if only for a night. Wow. Yeah. So, so this one is ta obviously talking about um, addiction and alcoholism. When I was younger, one of my uncles had explained to me, when we consume alcohol, um, basically what we're doing is we're consuming backwards medicine because in order to create alcohol, you take these things that the earth gives us and you, you poison it basically. And like you're, you're turning the medicine backwards and we're putting that inside of our bodies. And then it, um, 
it leaves space for other things to come into our bodies or our, our, our hearts or minds and kind of affect us in a way. And I kind of started thinking about um, like shadows when you want to get like really drunk and like blacked out. It's almost like there's like shadows in your memory. So I kind of, I started um, referring to those as like, as like shadow people. So I'm going to, I'm going to see where this poem takes me. Um, I don't think I'm done with it yet. but Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. So what's, uh, what's next for you, Tareen? What, what are you going to be, um, besides your masters, what, uh, what are you going to get into over the next year? Um, I'm going to be applying for a PhD program this fall. Um, I'm thinking of either doing my PhD at UBC, U of A. Um, I might even want to go check out Toronto for a while, but I was thinking that I'm going to be doing my PhD. It's going to be kind of like a hybrid thesis. I want to talk a lot about, I want to look into um, missing murdered Indigenous women. Um, I want to a lot of indigenous literatures into that um, different types of art forms and women's studies and um, so I'm gonna see I'm gonna kind of see what um, what programs are offered for me and what kind of people I'd like to work with but that's just kind of like my rough my rough idea of the next the next plan yeah but yeah I'll be getting a PhD after my master's It'll it'll be nice to call you Dr. Thomas for sure. That'll be that'll be <laughs> yeah. that'll be insane. That's cool. Has a ring to it. Um, it definitely does. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe some people have seen this. I don't know about uh, um, a lot, but um, you did a piece called Salmon and Berries uh, mm -hmm. recently for the um, what was the the Expanse Festival, correct? Yes. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that piece? Yeah, um, so that piece, that was actually, it was, it was a really incredible experience. I got to work with Barry Bolinski and Ayla Modest, and we turned one of my poetry pieces into a soundscape, and then we built it into a performance piece. It was actually, it was really incredible. We walked out and um, wearing we these white, these white bodysuits and white tights, and we had these, these black um, long jackets over us. And when we walked out, we took off the black jackets and we kind of like, we were, when we were planning out what we were going to be wearing, we kind of almost wanted them to resemble the, like the jackets that children in residential school wore. So we're taking off that jacket and then we're covered in white. And then we go into this um, centerpiece and I start to recite the poem and then Ayla is on the, the silks and everything and we're doing choreo. And then we have these berries um, cause it went, I'll, I'll read the poem for you after, but, um, basically we, we start to cover our entire bodies, our face, our hair. We put the berry juice, all, we stain it onto the white fabric that we're wearing, kind of like reclaiming our nationhood. And it was amazing. I've like, I've, I, it was one of the first times I was able to put one of my poetry pieces into like, like a performance art kind of display. It was, yeah, it was a. It was a lot of fun. Awesome, awesome. Do, yeah. you, do you want to um, read? It? Do you want to read us that one? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, pink salmon, purple berries smeared on my naked body. I was hungry for my culture, my own guts, my own blood. The salmon told me stories of Gitsan women in the smokehouse, smelt like fish and fire and honey, dancing on my tongue. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tareen, for um, being here, sharing um, your gift. We're really, really going to be excited and we're going to watch out for you because you're going to be doing some really amazing things out in Vancouver. And uh, I can't wait to uh, see Dr. Tareen Thomas on a book. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks for being here, Tareen. We'll talk to you later, okay? Okay. Okay. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Tareen Thomas from Enoch Cree Nation. Um, wonderful talent. I'm so uh, thankful that <clears throat> all of these writers um, got a chance to um, basically just display and share with you what, what they've been working on and uh, we thank them for that. If you're inspired by any of the things you saw today, please don't hesitate to visit dreamspeakers.org and donate whatever you can or you can text DREAM to 20222 uh, to donate $5. 
Thank you for joining us for the Dream Speakers Digital Series. We'll see you next time.